All right, so now we're going to get to the actual application of indifference curves and budget constraints. We're going to look at our indifference curves in order to get some predictions about behavior. And in order to do this, we have to look at the changes in either opportunities or the changes in preference. So the first application of this we're going to do is we're going to imagine a parallel shift. We're going to look at a parallel shift of the budget constraint. What a parallel shift means is really it's an expansion or a contraction of the available opportunities without a change in the price ratio. The two goods have remained equally as costly, but for some reason or another, our budget constraint has either moved back in or further out. Easy examples of this are losing a job or getting a new job or winning the lottery, uh, having some kind of lump sum payment given to you. Now, when there's a parallel shift out, it doesn't just lead to, oh, one obvious answer. Here we can see the budget constraint in the first example. Uh, from point B, we have a certain budget constraint. We can see that we have this parallel shift out to this new line where we've hit with B prime on our indifference curve. The same thing has happened in the second graph where we've shifted out, and the third graph where we have shifted out to a new graph. In all of these, we're comparing the difference between the number of french fries and the number of hamburgers that a consumer gets. But we have three different things that can happen with the theory of the consumer in a parallel shift. In the first example, we see a parallel shift out, and the number of fries goes down and hamburgers goes up. Right? From point B to B prime, we see that we get fewer french fries, but we get much more hamburgers. In the second example, the number of hamburgers goes down. We move back this way to the left in the second example of the number of hamburgers. But we've also moved up towards B prime, which is an increase in the number of fries. And then in the third example, we see that both hamburgers has increased and the number of french fries has increased to the point where we move out to that B prime. So we could get three different potential things happening here. What this leads us to is an understanding of normal goods and inferior goods. With a parallel shift, you can easily identify these. Given a parallel shift, which means there's no substitution effect, which we'll get to later, if the consumption of a good moves in the same direction as the income change, in other words, if income goes up and your consumption of that good goes up, or if income goes down and the consumption of that good goes down, we call this a normal good. An inferior good is the opposite of that. Given a parallel shift, which means there's no substitution effect, the consumption of the good moves in the opposite direction as the change in income. So in other words, if income goes up, consumption of that good goes down. If that's the case, we have an inferior good. Most people would assume that once a good is normal, it is always a normal good, and once a good is inferior, it's always an inferior good. And that just does not true. So it's a common mistake that always happens. Once normal, always normal, or once inferior, always inferior, does not work. So for example, we start at the bottom budget constraint. We can see that as we increased income to this second budget constraint, this parallel shift out, the number of hamburgers that we actually consume actually drops. Right? So we actually went back a little bit in our consumption of hamburgers. Then we see another parallel shift out from the second budget constraint to the third budget constraint, and clearly the number of hamburgers has gone up. My favorite personal example of this situation actually comes with ramen noodles. As an undergrad and really an early grad student, I ate a fair amount of ramen noodles and I had a low budget constraint. I was very constrained by my budget. Once I snagged my first job, ramen noodles really were an inferior good for me. I moved out my budget constraint quite considerably, and the number of ramen noodles that I consumed dropped backwards to the point where I ended up at a point like on the second budget constraint as shown. I started eating things like mac and cheese, really spoiling myself, sometimes going out to McDonald's or, I don't know, uh, cooking up some basic meals that you would find in your local freezer section. Once I got a real job, 
and started being paid a little bit better than that, my budget constraint got pushed out even further and I started having actual meals. I actually made meals for myself as opposed to just mac and cheese or things like that. The wealthy man's ramen noodles of Kraft mac and cheese was no longer my taste, but I actually made myself real meals. When I make real meals with this higher budget constraint here, I actually use crushed up ramen noodles again in some of my meals, such as things like salads. If you've never had it before, crushed up dry ramen noodles is actually a cool input for something like a steak salad. So my, my budget has gone up and my number of ramen noodles has also gone, gone up, which means now it is a normal good for me. So once again, once normal, always normal does not work. So now we've done a parallel shift of the budget constraint. Now the second thing we're going to do is we're going to imagine a rotation of the budget constraint. A rotation of the budget constraint basically shows one good becoming relatively cheaper or more expensive than the other good. In doing the rotation, we're going to bring in not only the income effect that we showed with the parallel shift, but we're also going to show the substitution effect. We're going to highlight the difference here as we do the rotations to understand what, the, what a substitution effect is and what an income effect is, which are very important terms in indifference curve analysis. So in order to do that, we're going to walk through an example. We're going to walk through this example quite extensively. We're going to have this budget constraint between apples and oranges. You can see we originally were at a, at a situation where we had a certain budget constraint, and now our budget constraint has rotated. It stayed the same with the amount of apples that we could consume, but now the number of oranges that we can consume has shot up drastically. So in this case, the price of oranges has dropped seriously. So it used to be that we had, say, $15. The price of an apple was $1, and therefore we could consume 15 apples. And the price of an orange was $3, and the max that we could consume, therefore, with our $15 would be Five. So given that information, we could draw this original budget constraint in. But now what we're saying is that the price has dropped from $3 for an orange to $1. Well, if the price of an orange is $1 and we have $15, that means that we could now get 15 oranges. Well, how many more apples can we get? Well, the price of an apple has remained the same. It's still $1 and we still only have $15. And so therefore, we can still only get 15 apples. So our budget constraint has rotated because the price of one good has changed relative to the price of the other good. So with that rotation, what we're going to be able to tell is really the substitution effect and the income effect. And then the substitution effect or the income and the income effect is going to be able to tell us if it's a normal or an inferior good. It's very important to identify the substitution effect first. The income effect will tell us if, it's, if the good is normal or inferior, but first what we have to do is we'll have to identify the substitution effect. Okay, so what are these two things? The substitution effect is the change in the amount consumed that is a result of the relative price change of the good. It is due to the relative price ratio. It is not due to, oh, uh, apples have become cheaper and so now we're a little bit wealthier. Instead, it's due to the fact that apples are cheaper relative to oranges or vice versa. The income effect is the other side of that. The income effect is the change in the amount consumed that is a result of us just having more income. If oranges get cheaper somehow, we can afford more oranges. And so there's going to be some impact of us getting more oranges just because now we can afford more. That's going to be the income effect. The substitution effect is because oranges are now cheaper relative to apples, and so we get more oranges because the relative cost has changed, or opportunity cost has changed. But then the income effect comes about because we have more income to use to get that good.
When looking at normal versus inferior goods, when we are doing a rotation analysis, not a parallel shift, you have to be much more careful because your income could actually increase and you could consume more of that good or a good, and yet it could still be inferior. Right? What we're really looking at is the change from the income effect to tell us whether it is a normal or an inferior good. I think this helps to demonstrate graphically. Okay, so let's go back to the example that we had. Remember we had this rotation. We originally had this budget constraint where we could consume five oranges and 15 apples. And then what happened is oranges became cheaper, so we're now wealthier, essentially. We can now consume more oranges, not just five, but 15. So we've moved our budget constraint out. We've become wealthier. But what we want to do is we want to stick to this original point, point A, where we were optimizing before this cheaper orange uh, occurrence happened. Right? And we want to stick to this point, point A. And we want to say, okay, what if the relative price of oranges and apples changed, but we weren't wealthier. We weren't able to consume more, right, more oranges. We didn't have this wealth effect. We just had this relative price ratio change. That's going to tell us the substitution effect. Remember, the substitution effect is the change that is a result of the relative price changes, but not from the change in wealth. So what we want to do is we want to stay at this sta same level of wealth, essentially, but then twist or change the ratio of the oranges to apples. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the new ratio that we have of oranges to apples. We're going to say, what? This is our ratio here. What is it? It's basically a one-to-one -one ratio in this nice example. What we're going to do is we're going to say, what if that ratio existed, but at the old level of wealth? So what we do is we take this line, the, the, the slope of the new budget constraint, and we move it back until it's just tangent with the old indifference curve. That's drawn in here with this dotted line. It's basically the new budget constraint parallelly shifted back until it just is touching the old indifference curve. What that's giving us is the old level of wealth, essentially, but the new price ratio. And we get this new point, point B here. So what we get is this move from a quantity of 3 to a quantity of 5 when we move from point A to point B. That's our substitution effect, the move from 3 to 5. The substitution effect is this increase in the number of oranges that would be purchased given the new relative prices or the new price ratio while still staying on that same indifference curve. That's our substitution effect. A parallel shift of the new budget constraint back onto the old indifference curve and then seeing where that resulting point is or the new optimal point would be and then showing the difference between the quantity of oranges and in this case it's a move from 3 to 5 that's our substitution effect. Obviously, what remains then is going to be the income effect. So in this case, it's the move from point 5 to point 7. This is the income effect. The income effect is what basically remains after the substitution effect. It's the additional consumption of oranges due to the increased purchasing power. Now, the substitution and income effect don't always move in the same direction. So basically show the same budget constraint here, but instead change the example from apples and oranges to apples and second-hand clothing. The budget constraint example really remains exactly the same, 15 and 5 to 15 and 15. But what we've done really is we've changed the shape of the indifference curve or the slope of the indifference curves to show you what can happen in having the substitution effect and the income effect move in different directions. So again, what we did is we took the new, or the new budget constraint, we parallelly shifted it back to the old indifference curve. Here's the old indifference curve and saw where it hit. So here's the parallel shift back, the dotted line. It hits at point B. The move from quantity at point A, which is 3, out to a quantity of 5 at point B,
That's the substitution effect. So from three to five, we get this substitution effect. But then we see that now that we're here at point B, moving the rest of the way out to point C is actually in the opposite direction. We actually move back uh, to a quantity of four of secondhand clothing at point C. Right? So we have completed the substitution effect here, but the income effect is an actual move from five to four. What does this show us? This shows us that secondhand clothing is an inferior good. If the income effect moves in the opposite direction of the substitution effect, you have an inferior good. If they move in the same direction, you have a normal good. So here again is another diagram for you to analyze, getting a different picture of it, and look at and see the substitution effect, the income effect, and then the overall total effect. And you can say, is this a normal good or is this an inferior good? Right? And this should be pretty straightforward. The substitution effect moves in the same direction as the income effect, and thus you have a normal good. In this example here, we have the substitution effect moving in the opposite direction of the as the income effect, and so you have an inferior good. In both of these cases, note that the good under consideration here as being normal or inferior is the good that's along the horizontal axis. The good that's along the vertical axis has a different substitution and income effect that can be analyzed differently, but here what we're doing is we're talking about the good on the horizontal axis. So in the original example, the good that was the secondhand clothes was the inferior good. It doesn't stand also true for the good that's along the vertical axis. Giffen goods are an extreme example of an inferior good. A Giffen good really isn't all that relevant to economic analysis because they're so incredibly rare to the point where you could actually argue that they're non-existent. Some people, some students really like to look to work on the quirky examples that could potentially be Giffen goods, but this doesn't really matter that much to real world important economic analysis. What a Giffen good is, is essentially a situation where an income effect works in the opposite direction of the substitution effect, so much so that it actually dominates the substitution effect. If that's the case, you have a Giffen good. In other words, if we look back at the last graph, uh, where we had an income effect and a substitution effect. The income effect worked backwards against the substitution effect, but the income effect wasn't larger than the substitution effect. If on the last graph point C was to the left somehow of point A, then we would have a Giffen good. It, that's a situation where the income effect is actually larger than the substitution effect. Again, these aren't really practical for actual economic analysis, and so we're not going to spend too much time on them. However, you should have an understanding as to what a Giffen good is and a basic introduction to it. That basically wraps up our introduction to indifference curves. You should have a basic understanding of what happens when there's a shift, or a parallel shift, or a rotation of budget constraints, what a budget constraint is, what an indifference curve is, uh, what the substitution effect is, what an income effect is, what a normal good, uh, inferior good, and a Giffen good uh, all are when compared to each other based on indifference curve analysis. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email or try and stop by and see me.